Lisa Savage, welcome. Thanks for being with us tonight. We're here to do Pathways to Progress. We are also a podcast now, so check us out on Spotify and like us and rate us. Um, I'm here tonight with Portland City Councilor uh, Victoria Pelletier and Roberto Check the Comprehensive Plan Rodriguez. And we are going to be reviewing uh, the year 22, 2022, uh, the, the, the roses, the beautiful, sweet things that happened, the thorns, the hard, difficult things that happened. And then we're going to spend some time on buds, in other words, potential, things that you're excited about, things that you see happening and developing. And hopefully uh, we'll come out of here with a lot of optimism for the new year. I know you guys feel a lot more relaxed being sophomores rather than fresh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I think um, <laughs> I was watching our first episode earlier today and I was I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I was such a baby. And now I'm, you know, I'm seasoned and we've been in for for a full year. So it feels nice to be a sophomore on the council and come into this new session, at least for me, just knowing a little bit more of like how it works. We've almost been meeting in person now for nearly a full year. So that feels really natural. Um, so yeah, being a sophomore on the council and at least just getting that first year down and surviving that first year for me feels like a really big deal. So yeah. it is a really big yeah. deal. It's an accomplishment. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I have a hundred percent. And I think if, maybe it's not always this way, but when we, our first month there seemed like the agendas were packed with like incredibly yeah. controversial issues. I think we were in the face of the, you know, the pandemic health protocols that were still making That's it right. feel like it was super, I mean, it was really intense. And in a, married, in a matter of like three or four months in the spring, I felt like things got more into a groove. And certainly now going into our sophomore year, I feel way more relaxed. I like yeah. that word a lot, you know, way more relaxed. And you know, you have familiarity with the patterns and the, the routine of things. Certainly knowing the people, like the department heads, that, that also helps a ton. And you, you, know, you start to build working relationships with people and know how they communicate, they get to know how you communicate. Certainly we have our own unique approach to the work. So yeah, definitely in a better place. Well, you kind of have a new council now. You have lots of new members, yes. And you don't have the charter. I mean, that, the charter commission only happens every 10 years. Right. So that's, yeah. you got that under your belt. Yeah. That was, that's so true, because that was happening on the background right. all through last year, which was incredibly heated and contested. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it, it spilled into our work, of course, and clearly we were part of the campaigns and, and the elections. Yeah, that's a layer. See, I almost forgot about mm -hmm. that. A significant layer mm -hmm. that we had to deal with. Yeah. yeah. We did a lot, yo. We did a lot, <laughs> yeah. And I think, too, it's like what some, something's always happening while we were on the council. And even just now, I was like, well, it's nice. Like, nothing will be going on, so we'll kind of get to just do the work. But then the mayor's race is going to be happening. So this was, will be Mayor Snyder's last year. And so mm -hmm. our third term, our third year on the council, um, we'll be serving with a new mayor as well. So that will be really interesting to see what happens with that. Right. And with a new city manager and also. That's right. Like we're, we're, I was telling, who was I talking to this week that I said, every council I feel you know, plays a role based on the circumstances of the time that they're, that they're serving in. And for a while there, you had a council that had you know, continuity. We had the same city manager and the same man, the same council it felt like for a long time. We had some several members that were there um, for many terms. And now we have a council that's here in a period of transition. Lots of interim department heads, a new, a new city manager coming in, a new mayor coming in, and, and like we just said, an entirely new council. So we're certainly in yeah. a period of transition. And you know, it, it feels like it's our responsibility to like um, carry the city and, and yeah. help people through, through a really difficult time of change. Well, let's look at 22 a little bit before we move on to what's going to happen in uh, 23. Who wants to go first? You want to start with the bad? You want to start with the good? Or? I feel like we should start with the bad. Okay. And then we can go to the good. That sounds good. So uh, what's your, <laughs> pick a couple thorns for us there, Victoria. Um, <laughs> shocker, I think my, one of my biggest thorns was obviously um, the hazard pay vote heard around the world and then the subsequent couple of months. That was a, that was my first couple meetings on the council. Uh, everyone was getting to know me for the very first time as well. And so I think that combined with everything uh, made it a really challenging time. The vote obviously didn't go the way that I wanted it to. Uh, but I do think that it helped me prepare for what it's like when you feel like the whole city is looking at you and talking about you. And I was getting a ton of emails. I was getting a ton of calls, a lot of heat. A lot of people were very upset with me. 
Um, and that was really challenging, but I also, I'm kind of glad it happened so early because then when I made it through the other side, I was like, well, that I was like, that was pretty bad, but I at least made it where I, I know that feeling really early. Um, so that was, that was tough and that, you know, certainly didn't go my way. Some of the charter questions didn't go my way either. I mean, that wasn't something that I had a direct, that I directly worked on, but I was really excited um, for a couple of the questions, specifically question two, I was actually excited just to see how that would really change um, our local government, how that would change the representation. And unfortunately, uh, that did not go my way either. But again, like that's the nature of this world of politics is that sometimes things go your way, sometimes they don't. Um, but I still am very excited to continue to advocate as much as I can to make local government as accessible to the people as possible. And I'm doing that a lot just through my own social media work. And I'm hoping that if anything, people feel a little bit more in the know as to what's going on than they did, um, you know, a couple years ago. So those are probably like my two thorns are just things that didn't go my way. But again, I think one of the first things I said on this show was that I, n not, like not everything is gonna go my way and I have to get over that really quickly. <laughs> so I think that I did and now it's just kind of moving forward for the future. Great. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know that I had any like, in, like particular vote or issue that I, um, that I felt really bad about not, um, not having it carried over the way that I wanted to. I, there were a couple of land bank um, votes, you know, where we're designating some some parcels to the uh, uh, to the land bank that I, I wanted us to make a, deep, a deeper dive into whether or not we could uh, potentially have housing development, and you know those those didn't I didn't do a good job at getting my uh, my votes aligned beforehand. But um, I think if there was one aspect of the work last year that was super super challenging, not challenging, but that that I did not enjoy and that was certainly a thorn. Um, mm -hmm. I think. You know, some of the dynamics with, with the District 3 counselor, um, I felt at times, you know, were just it, it beyond, I think, what I had expected to be the, to this work to include. I think at times it got really personal, you know, having him attack me on social media and just, you know, making accusations that were completely untrue. I think he was jeopardizing both the organization that I'm working with and my reputation and so much more. Mm -hmm. I, and I never understood where that came from. So that to me was really disheartening because there were, there were horrible attacks. He was clearly having people in this town siding with him that didn't care about you know, how ugly it got. They were just kind of adding fuel to the fire. And the fact that he just instigated that was really, it was disheartening. And that was certainly the biggest thorn. And, you know, and I totally appreciate the challenges of this work, right? Like I've been doing it for seven years now, or six years now. And um, I never experienced something like that from a colleague. So that, that was the biggest thorn for sure. Mm. I'm glad that that's over though. Yeah, well, that's behind you for sure. Yeah. Completely. Um, let's move on to some roses, some of the sweet okay. things. Um, I recently, well, I think my first early rose was I just got to spend a lot of time in a lot of our schools, and that mm. felt phenomenal to me to be able to visit with Portland High School, to be able to visit with Deering uh, Black Student <coughs> Union was amazing. I go to King Middle School, I feel like, pretty often. They're in my district, and I love hanging out with, with all the kids and the educators, so that that really kept me going was just getting to engage with young people. I'm super impressed by all of the all the, the young people that we have in schools and just how much they are involved in what's happening so much more than I was at that age and it's really inspiring <coughs> to see. And so that's always been one of my favorite parts is just getting to engage with the students as much as I can. And then uh, recently at our inauguration I got to read and sponsor a proclamation uh, for our racial equity work. And I'm really excited for that. It'll be the city's first um, DEI committee that we'll have, and it mm -hmm. will work with the new DEI manager that we're hiring, which we're still in the process of that. So it's essentially when this person gets hired, we will then form a DEI committee. And it feels exciting because um, that was kind of a lift. I think that was a lot of conversations of getting that to be cemented in writing. Mm -hmm. And I feel really excited that I was able to bring that across the finish line. And now going forward, regardless of who's hired or whether I'm there, whether I'm not, I'm, I'm excited that we can really start prioritizing uh, racial equity at the city of Portland. So that felt like a big win for me. It's good to get some infrastructure in place because yeah. then, as you said, people change circumstances shift, right. but if you have that vision and that goal, the, you know, 
that you what you want to accomplish that that's really helpful yeah. i kid you about re, re, you know return to the strategic plan but i'm totally like that myself I, if i don't understand what the context is i can't make sense of the individual yeah. fact or yeah. policy or whatever so i do think that's a huge step forward for portland so yeah. congratulations thank you awesome yeah so actually along the same lines the part that I felt most um, satisfaction with was the work that we did at the Sustainability and Transportation mm -hmm. Committee. Mm -hmm. And it was precisely because I always felt like there was a clarity into what we were doing. We were, you know, we're following the, uh, some of the, the big plans that multi-regional or multi-municipalities have, have um, come together to put forward and we've been kind of like taking part of it. So I feel like I know what we're trying to do. All we have to do is be good advocates and get as informed as possible and advance it. And then we build capacity, right, to get those structures by adding a position to the department. So that committee, to me, felt like really effective council work. Um, we've talked about wanting to be in positions where you, know, you are going to be effective and having a broad impact. And that committee has certainly been a good mm -hmm. lesson in, in how government can be effective in advancing things forward. So, that's been super, super rewarding. And, um, and the staff, too, has just been, Troy mm -hmm. and his staff yeah. has been amazing to work with. So by far, um, one of the most satisfying um, parts of the, uh, the weekly routines. Did you both keep your same committee yes. uh, assignments? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so in that committee, we start, we've been serving together and we'll continue mm -hmm. yep. this coming year with Council of Zero. Yeah. So committees are definitely a rose. I might have expected <coughs> you to say, wow, that's a lot of extra work. Wow, that's a lot of extra time. But that's where you really get in there and or, you know, do some things. And okay. on the council, yeah. there's a lot of procedural stuff, right? right. There's a lot of uh, just things that have to be dealt with. And yeah. that's really great to hear. So what are you excited <clears throat> about for the coming year? You've, you've alluded to a couple different things. Um, where do you see your work heading this year? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for what's to come. I mean, some of that definitely involves what I just talked about with the racial equity, hiring the racial equity manager. Um, you know, I hope that that's something that we can get moving forward on and maybe even have a determination in the spring or in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited too for our Health and Human Services and Public Safety Committee. It's the first time in Portland that we've had an all women committee. So that's really cool. I'm serving with Councilor Trevaro and Councilor Fournier. Um, and we're, we had a really great first meeting and we're talking about a lot of um, things in terms of making sure that we're cementing abortion here in Portland and making it as safe as possible. It is luckily still uh, legal here in Maine, but I think we're trying to put as much work as we can forward so that if anything does happen in the future, at least Portland is protected, so that's really exciting. Um, we're gonna look at making sure that we're providing as many resources as we can for our unhoused community members. The larger shelter is opening up in Riverside, I think in like a month and a half, I think maybe March, beginning of March. Mm -hmm. um, so that's gonna be a lot of conversations around staffing um, and around making sure that we are providing the necessary resources for people to get to and from. And I'm just looking forward, I think, to to us really putting out a lot of work. I think that committee specifically is so important in terms of the community aspect of Portland. And I'm similar to the Sustainability and Transportation Committee. It's a three person committee and I just, I'm excited for us to just churn out as much work as possible. So I certainly look forward to that um, and seeing where we are uh, at, the, at, at the end of the year. Great. Uh, I've, um, one of the pieces that I'm most excited about is carrying over the results of the election. So the clean elections um, ordinances that we have to put in place, we already have a timeline for that. And that's happening like in the immediate future. So we, we need to get that stuff in place by April, by April so that it could be part of our budget, right? Because we need to fund it somehow. Mm -hmm. And then the candidates that want to run for November, they, that it is accessible to them. Mm -hmm. So that, I'm re I talked about how important I thought that was and mm -hmm. how transformative that really could be for municipal government and democ democracy uh, as a whole. So I'm really excited to, be, uh, to play a role in that. Um, Can you share any details of what you think the clean election opportunities for candidates are going to be, or are we still? I think that what, too so far out there's there. still a lot to be determined. But what I heard, what we heard from the city clerk's office is that they're looking at the state um, uh, procedures and see how much of that we can mirror here. 
but I know that there's groups that have been talking with the city clerk's office to look at programs like in other cities like Seattle and New York. And there's some really interesting uh, clean election programs out there where uh, registered voters or even non-registered voters like residents have vouchers and that's the way that they could contribute to um, candidates' campaigns. And it, I've heard already uh, a multitude of ideas that are out there. I'm not sure how, how far and broad we can explore them and what's applicable here to Portland, but I'm, I'm excited that we have a city clerk's office that's receptive to hearing to community to hear from community partners about these ideas and and then when we get to dive into the work we'll figure out what's the best match for Portland but again that's transformative work and I'm excited to be part of that yeah vouchers what an yeah. interesting well, isn't that idea. yeah I think yeah. Seattle does that yeah. and um, Seattle does it that. is yeah mm -hmm. it's and it's and I hear that it's not it, like because they automatically mail their ballots to register voters mm -hmm. you automatically get those vouchers so like you yeah. get a high percentage of, of and then participation. you said but even if they aren't registered voters they can get I believe that I heard there was examples of like non registered voters just residents being able to participate in the clean election so it's in a way kind of like a vote before you get to vote mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you get to support that candidate financially with your voucher so that's an idea I think I don't know again if Portland has the capacity to run a program that um, detailed but exciting that that's an option out there for us to explore right well Portland's not that big of a city that populous of a city so it seems like that might be it's kind of uh, it's analogous to you have to collect signatures to get nominated right, right? Yeah. to get your name on the ballot um, and so basically you're collecting the funding to go with that because you both know getting a signature getting your name on the ballot I, that, that, that does not a campaign make right no. <laughs> and, and you end up reaching into your pocket a lot yeah right yeah. and some people are in a position to do that and some people aren't and that's something that we're always reminding uh, viewers about that it's not good representative government if only the people with the resources to do that can get their name on the ballot right. or get elected. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There are too many constituencies and issues that just don't make it into the conversation. So, wow, that would be exciting. Yeah, I don't think the state of Maine is giving out vouchers for clean money. I don't see it happening <laughs> anytime right. soon. What's the state model? You can donate $5 to any candidate, yeah. and it doesn't have to be a candidate in your own district. And if they get enough, right, there's like a trigger point where they've got enough people have given them five dollars, and then they qualify for the for the clean elections fund. Do, are you in favor of setting that bar pretty high, pretty low? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, in terms I, of how much money or vouchers or whatever do uh, does a candidate have to get to. I think that because the municipality has to hold that within its budget, we kind of have to be mm -hmm. realistic. But I think the idea is that it grows, right? That yeah. we can we can expand it. And also, there's there's circumstances that happen at different times of the campaign trail that people are going to need additional funds, or you know, there's there's and there's different types of campaigns, right? Like a city a city council district race versus a mayoral race are going to be two completely different mm -hmm. um, experiences and have a different financial requirement. So we'll have to see what what other municipalities do was within our budget capacity and um and again if there's an idea that we can revisit this year over year and either expand it or tweak it as as the circumstances dictate and our candidates going is it going to be mandatory in other words is everybody going to be a clean elections candidate or i would love it I person that a that can be... take corporate money over here and outspend the clean elections people or i would love it for it to be mandatory i, know, I doubt too. we'll get that you both too. would yeah okay well there's absolutely. two votes right yeah there. yeah <laughs> Yeah, right, mm -hmm. two votes. Because so. yeah. I, <laughs> I know that is an issue at the state level and at mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. national level where people are like, I ran clean elections once, but my opponent didn't, so then I was outspent completely, yeah. and I'm not sure I want to do that again. Even people that philosophically think... Yeah clean election funds are, are the way to go. Yeah. Mm. I think that you know the, the one of the biggest problems and we saw it with the charter campaign is not the candidates themselves but like those those action committees that get mm. formed. Mm. So if that's why I really want to limit like they raised half a million half a, dollars. I think, it, I think they ended with a million. <laughs> wild yeah. deal in this city. Mm -hmm. So that's the stuff that I think we really need to like put a hold on. I mean yeah. if, if we can yeah. get $10,000 to run an at-large campaign I mean I ran on the less than that. Um, I think that's that's a reason for me. That's reasonable for for candidates. Mm -hmm. But those action committees, I think that stopping that craziness that we saw last year, that we should all have urgency towards that. Mm -hmm. That was horrible. I yeah. mean, no, no one in this city enjoyed the way that those campaigns that were being funneled oh, by Airbnb yeah. and not all, Uber. Yeah, that's awful. No one enjoyed. They seeing tend that to be stuff. real negative yeah. and at, yeah. like personal attacks. Yeah. And that doesn't fit into this city. That that mm -hmm. stuff yeah. is not what Portlanders want mm -hmm. in their politics. 
So you no. think the council can create a law that keeps political action committees from participating in elections? That is very ambitious. I would what be I very impressed. I'm not being skeptical. I'm just I'm like, wondering yeah. how that would work. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like a dream. Well, yeah. I know. I was like, add that to the list of, of buds. That could be coming up. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you never I know. think it's, it's certainly, you know, we all talked about uh, having big, you know, systemic impact. I think that that's the kind of stuff that we meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be Absolutely. huge, in fact. Mm -hmm. Could we talk about transportation a little bit? It's a subject near and dear to my heart just yeah. because I've lived in places where public transportation was available to even the most low income people. And in this country, you basically, you know, often have to keep a car to even be employed in this state, especially. And uh, so, what's on the, you know, what's what's a bud for transportation that you see mm -hmm. developing here? Uh, I mean, you honest. talked about shuttle, uh, some kind of transportation out to the new shelter because it's not in the city center. It's yeah, I'm Somewhat not remote. And, and again, we're we're hoping there's an advisory group that's being created for that type of conversation. Um, and so our committee will have like a, you know, a little bit of a look into it. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the biggest concerns was the level of transportation and when um, it's going to be running to and from the new shelter. The new shelter is in Riverton. It's off Peninsula. And it's going to be really challenging, I think, for a lot of people who need that shelter to be mm -hmm. able to get there. So that I think is the number one question is, how is it running? When is it running? Is it, who is it going to pick up? Um, and how can we make sure that that's not an issue uh, to, of getting people the care that they need? Because I, you know, I think even where I am, my, I have Deering Oaks Park in my district. District One has like the Bayside area not in their district, and that, um, you know, those areas are certainly going to be like places where I hope the shuttle would be considering picking up. Uh, but again, like I, I have no idea, it will really depend on the conversations that are happening at the advisory committee level. And I'm hopeful that we can have our eye on it um, through our HHS committee to make any changes that we need to make. But yeah, that's a huge, huge question. Yeah, and, it, and I think other than, you know, like the, the immediate, when you talk about transportation, the immediate thoughts of like, you know, vehicles and, and buses, I think the, the pedestrian and bicycle aspect, right? Like looking at our city and to making it more pedestrian friendly. So there's a lot I think that we can start doing. This, these things take many years, right? Because there's a lot of investments, particularly we were talking in our committee about sidewalks. You know, we have to make commitments in the CIP where year over year we're spending a percentage of that CIP money to create more sidewalks and to create more of these, you know, the signal walking paths, particularly in Forest Avenue, which is like a highway out there. Mm. So anything that we can do to make it more pedestrian friendly and bicycle, these, these forms of transportation that are a little bit more accessible to people. And in a city our size, I think if we go in that route, mm -hmm. we can probably make it a lot easier for people to get around without depending on those vehicles. Um, and then obviously the infrastructure to those um, really needy folks and making sure that those shuttles run in time, that they're accessible. Um, yeah. And so this is going to be a separate from the regular bus system that serves Portland or it will so. be a, yeah. oh you do? Yep. Okay. Yep. What's the thinking there? I think it's, I think they're trying to just make sure that they have a shuttle that all they're doing is going back and forth from the shelter. At least that's my hope mm -hmm. and that there, there's no like time constraints of when there is going to be a to and from shuttle. But again, I, I got to tour the facility. It feels oh, like did. so, I did, but it was, oh my gosh, I don't even remember when we were getting to do those tours. It was before the holidays um, and it wasn't done. So I'm looking forward to going again because there were a lot of questions like that mm -hmm. that were still being worked on by the time that I got to tour it, so. And what's the capacity of the Riverton shelter intended to be? Yes. It's much more than the, in, you yeah. know, in the Oxford Street shelter. Yeah, I want to say on the women's much, side, it was okay. like close to like 70 or 80. And then I think mm -hmm. on the men's side, it was 60, I think. Mm -hmm. These are the numbers that came into my head immediately. I put it all on my phone when we were there visiting. But mm -hmm. it is going to be a lot larger than anything that we have now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Families can stay there? Families can stay there. They have certain areas that will be dedicated to families. Mm -hmm. But I think, too, with a couple of the other shelters that we have, I think that they're hoping to alleviate the impact for these family shelters where single individuals will be using Riverton and then the family shelter will be, will be able to, to remain mm -hmm. operational. Mm -hmm. And presumably there will be uh, feeding uh, meals there because it's too far to come in yeah, to the, the last, soup kitchen. Yeah, the last time I was there, they had, um, they were gonna do an RFP for some local 
food options to make sure because of course we have a lot of different ethnicities and races and cultures here and so they wanted to make sure that they had culturally relevant food so the, that's the last that I heard is that they were going to do a couple of RFPs for food delivery service mm -hmm. so so we'll see I hope I can get to tour it again because again it's supposed to open I think March 1st which is so much sooner than I actually thought that it was going to open. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to see it um, again one more time before they do. And I'm sure that I'm sure those emails are coming to us, you know, any minute. Well, I think my grandchildren would think I was remiss if I didn't in our last few minutes here ask you about the parks and recreation situation in Portland. What do you see happening there? Will uh, my grandchildren just love the parks you know that we go from one park to the next to the next to the next um, anything happening in parks that we should know about or the rec programs I, again I don't well, live in Portland so. I mean I the parks are the ever you know changing conversation of what are, what are we utilizing parks for it's the notice I didn't say the FT word the, <laughs> it's the <laughs> continuous back and forth and that I think was the mo was most relevant in our Recent vote, I feel like, again, time is, is escaping me. It was maybe a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago, the Payson Park conversation about whether or not we were going to have a concert in Payson Park. That drew out a lot um, of responses from individuals that were saying parks are not for concerts, parks are for concerts, Payson Park can't hold it, where, why can't it be somewhere else? Similar to the food truck conversation on the Eastern Prom, do food trucks belong in the park, do they not? And so I think we're, we're trying to figure out our park usage and what it's for and what it will, how it will serve Portland as we continue to grow and expand. Um, so, you know, I look forward to having more of those conversations. We haven't, we postponed the Payson Park vote. The food truck determination actually should be coming out in probably a couple of weeks. But it's, 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 it's an interesting discussion to have in Portland because people are very passionate about parks and what they're supposed to be used for. So. So I don't know. To answer your question, <laughs> to answer your question, I'm not sure what's there going to be happening with the parks. There might be concerts. There might be food trucks. Or there might <laughs> not be. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> um, well, we are coming toward the end of our show. Is there a last thought that either of you would like to share with us about uh, 2023? What you think is going to excite you, or shall we thank our crew and? Yeah, I mean, I'm thankful that we're able to be here so thank you <laughs> thank you both of you and to Portland Media Center because I'm glad that we get to continue this into our sophomore year I actually think that's really cool and it's a big privilege that we get this platform to share and I mm -hmm. like watching our old episodes and seeing how we've grown and changed and you know it's been it's been really fun so that's all I have to share is like this is the first episode of 2023 um, and I'm excited to see where we are at the end of the year Absolutely. This, I think this is um, definitely uh, uh, one, of the, one of the roses, one of the, the yeah. shining moments of the year. And it started really kind of like, um, like low key where yeah. it was like, hey, let's just try this. And I, I didn't have any idea how long we'd be doing it. I thought it'd be, you know, the first few months or whatever. Yeah. And then it, it, became, it was obvious then that we did have a routine and then we, we were set here on the schedule. And yeah, I'm excited for this year to do it again. And I feel we missed a month. So I feel like we, we really had good momentum, kind of like a little bit of a hiccup. But here we're back. Um, yeah, I'm really, this has definitely been a, 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 I'm really grateful to have done. It's been a great opportunity and looking forward to doing it again this year. Great. Well, I'm super excited that we became a podcast. So our yeah. whole Yay. archive, yeah. all our first eight shows are on Spotify. They will be on Apple too. Um, but right now they're on Spotify and that's great to be yeah. people can revisit that. And now going forward, each uh, episode will be a podcast. And I know that you, Roberto, thought that that would help build audience, that not everyone's going to sit through a, a video or watch live TV, great as it is. Um, but uh, they can listen to a podcast while they're making dinner or, you know, whatever they're doing. So um, that's, a, that's a great leap for it. I think that's yeah. my bud that I would I would say. Yeah. Rose, working with you all, working with the wonderful Warren Edgar, our director, and yes. Jeffrey Cooper, our um, audio wizard, and David Bedell, our cameraman. Thank you so much. Could not do the show without you. Thank you to Portland Media Center for hosting us. And thank you to our audience, because obviously, without an audience, uh, we don't have a show. You've been so encouraging, and I've heard so many positives from uh, people that I know that have watched the show and really feel that it's useful, and they learn things, and That's they great. feel closer to their city government uh, because you take the time to do this. So, That's awesome. Let's that. try and maybe do it a little more often. 
We, 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 said, we said we'd do it once a month, and that's been a little challenging. We're going to try to stick. That's my New Year's resolution. All right. <laughs> Monthly. There you go. Works for me.